Sydney control to Qantas 755. Qantas 755. It was a case of the money or the bomb. Who are you? Call me Mr. Brown. In a plot ripped straight from Hollywood. Do not repeat, do not go below 20,000 feet. Mr. Brown threatened to blow up a plane full of passengers. What type of explosive or how it got there, we can only guess at this stage. Unless Qantas paid his ransom. $500,000. It was the real-time crime that stopped the nation. If you panic in the flying business, you're dead. Investigative crime reporter Adam Shand follows the money trail. How much did he give you? 100 bucks. 100 bucks. So where is all the missing cash? Someone knows where that money is. And was Mr Brown also a murderer? We begin tonight with some startling allegations about one of Australia's most notorious criminals. It's one of Australia's most audacious crimes. On May 26, 1971, a British extortionist who called himself Mr Brown called the Commonwealth Police at Sydney Airport and made a frightening claim. He said he'd placed a bomb on board Qantas Flight 755 bound for Hong Kong. To prove he was serious, Mr Brown told them to take a look inside an airport locker number 84, where they'd find another working bomb, identical to the one on QF-755. The police went and looked in the locker. And what did they find? True to his word, Mr. Brown had built an altimeter bomb with 12 sticks of gel ignite primed to explode. Immediately I thought, man, this could be a, this could be a really interesting movie. Ten years prior to his Oscar nomination for Shine, filmmaker Scott Hicks made a movie about the Qantas extortion. Call me Mr. Brown. Hicks stayed true to the real events of the day as they unfolded. He cast Chris Haywood in the key role of Mr. Brown. He made an altitude bomb and the police and uh, experts were convinced that it was a working altimeter bomb. The replica bomb had been fitted with an altimeter, which meant that if there was a bomb on flight 755 with 116 passengers and 12 crew on board, it would be blown to smithereens when it descended below 20,000 feet. He was very clever because he'd picked a flight of nine hours, I think Sydney, Hong Kong non-stop, in other words, he'd calculated that would give us time to think about it, you know, very clever. In 1971, John Orme was Chief Press and Information Officer for Qantas. Before that, he had been a war correspondent and a Spitfire pilot in World War II. Was this the most exciting stroke, thrilling, ominous day since your, your war service? Uh, I'll put it this way. Apart from the war, <laughs> my war, it was the most interesting day in my life. John Orme was working at Qantas House in Sydney CBD when Mr Brown rang, asking to speak with the big boss. Now, the general manager was then Bert Ritchie. He was an ex-airline pilot, a lovely guy, but he was out having lunch, I think, with the rail commissioners. 
Phil Housen, who was the deputy general manager, he'd been an Air Force officer, he took the call. But Mr. Brown only wanted to talk to Richie, so Housen had to impersonate the boss. What the hell am I going to say to him? And this is, you know, about one, one o'clock. And I was in the general manager's office the, the entire time. Hello, Richie here. Uh, this is Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. I understand you're threatening us with a bomb explosion. Is that right? That's right. In what aircraft, Mr. Brown? It's all in the letter. I'm going to ring you back at 3 p.m. What's that? I'll call back at 3. These phone calls that he made to Qantas, which I have in my movie, they are verbatim transcripts of the original phone calls. There's no invention there. Both sides are totally bemused by the situation that they're in. Well, uh, I hope Mr. Brown... You know, there's nothing going on that would endanger the lives of any of our passengers or the aeroplane. By now, Captain Ritchie had returned from lunch to be met by police. Detective Sergeant McNeil, break-in squad. Captain Ritchie, you chaps took your time. Right. What does Qantas plan to do? We're treating this one for real. Our only concern must be for the safety of the passengers and the crew. And if it's a hoax? And if it isn't, are you prepared to live with that decision? Sydney Control to Qantas 755. We're recalling you to Brisbane to check out a threatening call. Maintain your present altitude. Do not repeat. Do not go below 20,000 feet. The plane only had nine hours of fuel on board, so the pressure was on to find a solution with Mr Brown. The actual planning of the event, including making the bomb, you'd have to say involved quite a bit of skill. But then the actual event itself, carrying out the, the ransom demands, seemed so amateurish. Some of those calls, which were recorded, he seems quite uncertain about the amount of money at one stage. Uh, let me see now. Look, we're demanding $50,000. $50,000? Oh, sorry, I mean uh, $500,000. You sound rather unsure of yourself, Mr Brown. Well, I don't know much about this sort of thing. Aside from the fact that it was a very devious sort of plot that he, he sort of put into play, he seemed very ill-prepared for success. <laughs> and he seemed as surprised as anyone when things started to actually go in his direction as the day wore on. Oh, I thought you was taking it a bit, uh, you know... Uh, well, I thought you wasn't bothering too much, actually. Uh, not at all. Oh, well... We have an aeroplane up there, Mr. Brown, with 116 people in it. We're greatly concerned that they arrive on the ground safely. Passengers' safety has always been the first priority at Qantas, a tradition that goes right back to 1920, when the airline was founded by Hudson Fish and Paul McGuinness. Both were World War I veterans and flying aces, with an iron will to survive. A large proportion of Qantas management had been Air Force operational people. The staff manager was a flying boat uh, pilot. The commercial manager was a Kitty Hawk fighter pilot. Uh, I was a Spitfire pilot. So, you know, in the flying business, we don't do panic. If you panic in the flying business, you're dead. It just reminds me of that famous quote from Keith Miller, the cricketer. He was asked about pressure in test cricket. He said, that's not pressure. Yeah. A mesh made up your ass is pressure. That, that, exactly, <laughs> exactly. By late afternoon, the aircraft had been recalled back to Sydney, where it was kept in a holding pattern, burning precious fuel while Housen negotiated with Mr Brown. 707 left Sydney with everything indicating just another routine flight to Hong Kong. But the 130 people on board were just settling down when first word of any trouble was heard. The 
the media seemed to be onto the story pretty early while the plane was still in the air. Do you recall how that leaked out? The media actually agreed not to run with it for a while. What happened then, later in the afternoon, when the plane was sent to circle over Botany Bay, they'd sent out submarines, the Navy. It was becoming a really big thing that no one could keep the lid on. So from that point, the press knew. There's still a great deal of mystery around the whole incident, but the captain is known to have radioed that he believed there was an alive altitude bomb on board. What type of explosive or how it got there, we can only guess at this stage. Qantas agreed to pay the entire ransom, $500,000. Mr Brown insisted they give him the money in the small bag the replica bomb had been in. But that was never going to work. So John Ulm and the Qantas team had to improvise. And so we sent somebody up to the canteen who bought two suitcases. Very, very cheap. No blue, I think. How was Qantas able to get half a million dollars so quickly? Well, it's, it's a very effective banking service in this country. You, you just sign a cheque and you go to your bank and they give you half a million dollars. It was a very impressive service from our friends in the Reserve Bank. By now, it was getting dark. As the aircraft continued to circle Botany Bay, rapidly running out of fuel, Mr Brown drove a stolen yellow combi van through the streets of Sydney. He was headed for Qantas House in Chifley Square, where he'd negotiated to pick up the two blue suitcases full of money. Mr Rohn, can you tell us how the money was handed over? The second last call very suddenly gave us 15 minutes notice to have it available here in, uh, in Sydney. Just before 5.45, Captain Ritchie carried the money downstairs in the elevator in two blue suitcases. The yellow hire van drew up uh, as the telephone plan had set it up. Robert Ritchie approached the van. This man uh, waved a small key, which was the signal to indicate this was the pickup van. He couldn't get the suitcases through the window, which was the original plan. The cases won't fit. The man in the van, whom Captain Ritchie reported was in his mid-twenties. What do you want? Uh, down here. Wearing what appeared like a, a false beard. And with that... Mr Brown was off. So where were the police all this time? It's almost Keystone Cops, in a way, and I'm not saying that with any pointed disrespect. Qantas House has two entrances. Hunter Street has two lifts. The main entrance has four lifts. When it came to the point, OK, the police better go down, all the lifts were locked because the cleaners... What now? Nobody told the cleaners. Oh, get out! By the time the police cottoned onto the action, Mr Brown was long gone with the loot. He got away in the middle of Sydney, in the rush hour, in the only yellow combi van in the southern hemisphere. It disappeared without a trace. Coming up, was it the perfect crime? Mr Linder, perhaps we can start by asking you, is this the elusive Mr Brown? And the Hollywood connection. Would you mind repeating what you told the ticket agent? I told him I'd placed a bomb aboard your Flight 6 to New York. The atmosphere here at Sydney Airport is electrifying as we wait out the final minutes of what must be the greatest alert ever experienced here in Sydney. As we watch the skies, we can only wait and hope. As the aircraft slowly descended from 35,000 feet, its fuel tanks almost empty, Mr Brown collected his ransom money, a cool half a million dollars from Qantas House. 
The deal was he'd call back and tell Qantas where the bomb was hidden on board so the flight crew could disarm it before the plane dropped below 20,000 feet. And true to his word, he called back. Hello, Richie here. No, look, the bomb's not on the plane. The bomb is not on the plane. Well, it's better than it wasn't. <laughs> I mean, it was dead sure that nothing had happened. And there are the lights now in what we uh, believe is the big Qantas jet. The next few minutes will tell whether we have a safe landing. Less than 30 feet off the runway now, the main north-south runway. And it's down. It looks like a safe landing. It was an enormous relief, especially for passengers and crew. For you, what was the most nerve-wracking moment of this flight? Well, when we commenced descent, I think it would be. But uh, when we reached 22,000 feet, we were advised from the ground that there was no uh, bomb on board. What time was this? It's about uh, 20 minutes before it landed. Um, everyone was very calm about this, and the, the, the cabin crew, the stewards and the hostesses were really wonderful. And you're flying again tonight? Well, we hope so, yes. We really do. The ordeal was over, and Australia could breathe again. But as police inquiries got underway, it was clear they were struggling. They found the combi van, but they had no leads on Mr Brown. So they improvised with a mannequin. Mr. Lyndon, perhaps we can start by asking you, is this the elusive Mr. Brown? No, David, it is not Mr. Brown. It is what might be termed an impression given by three eyewitnesses of uh, what they consider Mr. Brown looked like in a fleeting glance. And whilst the incident is still fresh in some person's mind, we hope to recapture from that person's mind his impression of this man. As I say, this is a hurried operation, but you've got to remember this, that almost a week has now passed by since this man picked the money up. The police had nothing. And there was pressure on Mr Brown as well. He was sitting on a huge pile of unmarked $20 bills. And now he needed an exit strategy. Very few people see that much money at one time, so... I arranged to get into a bank, and the bank very kindly put together a half a million dollars in $20 notes, which surprisingly takes up a big amount of space. It conjures up dreams of expensive motor cars, a private plane perhaps, a palatial mansion, or even your own South Pacific island. For Mr Brown, they're dreams which theoretically could become a reality. A lot of people started to speculate, well, half a million dollars in $20 notes, you know, What's he going to do with that? We did it, Ray. We did it. We did it. You. We'll never get away with it. <laughs> we have got away with it. Now all we've got to do is lie low until things cool off. Mr Brown could not have done this crime on his own. His accomplice was a Sydney bartender. Raymond James Pointing. He helped make the replica bomb and typed up the letters of demand to Qantas. You better keep the lid on your spending. How are we going to cover ourselves if people start asking questions about the money? It would probably be difficult to put it into a bank account, at least half a million. And uh, although the banks were keen to tell me, I did an interview with a bank official who said... We'd be delighted to get a new account for half a million dollars, but uh, on the other hand, this wouldn't happen. Uh, you know, we'd have our checks and balances, but it, as it turned out, he was able to put... Uh, quite large sums into bank accounts using aliases. Bill Day, Ivan Jay, uh, someone called Adams. Were people aware of those aliases at the time? No. He'd been using the name King or Brown. King was the name that Pointing knew him under. It's extraordinary that Raymond Pointing didn't know the true identity of Mr Brown, nor did the real estate agents who sold him an old butcher shop in the Sydney suburb of Annandale for $14,750. They knew him as Billy Day.
He also used an alias to buy an impressive penthouse in Bondi for $41,000. crooks had played their cards right, they could have got away with this. They could have left the country undetected with the loot. But Mr Brown had come to love the good life around Sydney and he was keen to enjoy his money. The police machine is painstakingly checking down a number of lines, hoping they'll turn up the lead they're seeking. The police were desperate to solve the case. They posted a $50,000 reward for information leading to Mr Brown. And they soon hit the jackpot. Both he and his accomplice, Pointing, just went mad. Bought six or eight expensive cars, paid all in $20 bills. He really blew his own cover. When the police finally caught up with Mr. Brown, he scrambled for another alias. What's your full name? Raymond James Pointing. What, Mr. Pointing? You don't mind if we have a look in your boot, do you? Hey, Bob, take a look at this. The jig was up. Pointing was also arrested in his own name. Right. Fancy seeing you here. Is this the man you know as Peter King? Yeah, it is. I put it to you that you are, in fact, Peter Pasquale Macari, wanted in England on various charges. Macari? I'm Peter Macari. And I'm Mr. Brown. Next. The Mount Isa connection. We pulled him out of the mine. And the mine manager, I remember saying, why did you do it? And I thought, why did I do what? Peter Macari, a.k.a. Mr Brown, Billy Day, Peter King and a host of other aliases has been arrested over the Qantas bomb hoax. But how did he come up with this simple but highly effective extortion plot? Well, it turns out his inspiration came from Hollywood. In 1966, Twilight Zone creator Rod Serling terrified American viewers in his TV movie, The Doomsday Flight. After Flight 6 took off from Los Angeles, a stranger called from a public phone to reveal his fiendish plot. He's on to. Would you mind repeating what you told the ticket agent here? I wouldn't mind at all. I told him I had placed a bomb aboard your Flight 6 to New York. Just like Peter Macari five years later, the movie villain had built an altimeter bomb. But in the doomsday flight, the villain managed to hide his bomb <laughs> aboard the plane. In the film, the bomb is on the plane in the pilot's bag. Macari thought, well, I can do this without a bomb on the plane, which was quite clever. It was, yeah, there's no doubt about that. In 1971, Brian Harding was in the New South Wales breaking squad. It was his job to investigate the replica bomb and see if anyone else was involved in the hoax, besides Macari and Pointing. Of course, the detonators and the explosives came over to the breaking squad for investigation, and fairly early in the piece, we established that they were from Mount Isa. Mount Isa was, and still is, a very large mining town in Queensland. Police believe Macari had a connection there. We went up to Mount Isa and uh, through a process of elimination, we identified a particular person. His name was Frank Sorahan. 
And do you recall the circumstances of the arrest? We pulled him out of the mine. And there's these guys dressed in suits all around the place. And I didn't know what was going on. Then they, they called me. This is the first time Frank Sorahan has spoken publicly about his role in the great Qantas hoax. I Skyped him in outback Queensland, where he still lives. They took me up to the um, manager, the, the, the mine manager, and the mine manager, I remember saying, why did you do it? And I thought, why did I do what? Frank Sorahan was a naive 20-year-old mine worker when Peter Macari arrived at Mount Isa in early 1971. Met him uptown at a, uh, a cafe there. You know, he used to go uptown, play pool and things like that back in the day. And met him there and sort of just got talking. And then he started asking about explosives and things like that. See what I mean? Simple. Can you get any more of this stuff? Uh, without anyone finding out? Maybe. What do you want it for? Oh, just a little project I had in mind. Blow up a couple of tree stumps. Harmless. Well, we'll see what we can do, eh? So I bought some up from underground and gave them to him. I didn't sell them to him. He came back to Isa after the hoax and he gave me some money. And I had that in my life when the cops uh, got me. How much did he give you? 100 bucks. 100 bucks? Yeah. He just made $500,000, Frank, and you got 100 bucks, eh? I, I think he was also checking on me to see if the penny had dropped, and clearly it hadn't. Zorahan was charged by the police as an accessory, but the charges were dropped when the court accepted he had no idea what Macari was up to. Macari was sentenced to nine years in jail. Summing up, Judge Staunton described Macari as a clever and resourceful criminal. He said Macari had been instrumental in bringing into action the defence systems of the country and had disrupted an international airline. Judge Staunton added he was satisfied that Macari was not in the least contrite. How much do you talk about the plot? Well, not very much, really. Like, everyone knew that he did it. His greatest claim to fame at Maitland, I think, was he was the projectionist, you know, on the Saturday afternoon movies. In those days, you used to have a, a movie projector. They didn't show Doomsday Flight? <laughs> Not while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> the prisoners were more interested in what happened to Macari's loot from the Qantas hoax. Let's face it, 500 grand was a lot of money back in 1971. It still is today. We know that Macari bought the old butcher shop in Annandale. After he went to jail, it was discovered he'd bricked up the chimney. And behind those bricks, the police found a big pile of $20 notes. Soon they found another $70,000 stashed beneath floorboards in a house in Balmain. Even though there's still thousands of dollars to be accounted for, police believe they've recovered the majority of money from the Qantas hoax. The next step in the case will be for detectives to question Macari in the hope that he may reveal where the remainder can be found. The only time I really saw him upset was when they, <laughs> they recovered all this money. Well, he wasn't too happy that day. Because <laughs> he was thinking he'd probably get out and it's his little stoop to well, come back to. Well, I would assume that that's what he was thinking. With the cash counted and the property sold, there was still about $250,000 missing. And to this day, it has never been recovered. 
Did he ever get any attention from other inmates about saying, well, we know that half the money is still outstanding? Yeah, a couple of, yeah, a couple of well-known crims fronted him and said, listen, you know, where's the money? But you know, he said, oh, look, there's none left. I don't know where it's gone. And you know, they just let it go at that. When Peter McCarry was released from jail in 1980, he was taken straight to the airport to be deported back to Britain. He was still holding his secrets close. Peter, would you like to tell us what happened with the balance of the money? Mm -hmm. Nothing. How do you feel about being deported? I want to go. Where will you be going now? London, I hope. You worried about the police waiting for you in London? No. Makari has now been handed over to three security officers who will stay with him all the way to London. And isn't it ironic that this, his last flight out of Australia, is by courtesy of Qantas. Next. Peter Makari, the man known as Mr Brown, was implicated in a murder mystery a year earlier. Is Peter Macari also a murderer? Did that strike you as a motive for murder? We're rolling the story forward to 1994. Two decades after the Qantas hoax. Sydney reporter Basil Sweeney finds a new, darker angle to the story. He writes of a young Englishman, William Albert Day, known as Billy, who vanished during a working holiday in New South Wales in 1970. By now, almost everyone except his family has forgotten about Billy. But Sweeney reveals that the last person to see Billy Day was Peter Macari, the Qantas extortionist. And the story strongly suggests that Macari had a hand in Billy Day's fate. We begin tonight with some startling allegations about one of Australia's most notorious criminals. Peter Macari, the man known as Mr Brown, was implicated in a murder mystery a year earlier. Macari's name raised again as the centre of another investigation, this time into the disappearance of English tourist Bill Day, who vanished a year before the extortion. My name's Mark Murdoch, and in 1994, I was a detective sergeant at the Homicide Squad. I was just uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough to be allocated the investigation. As the lead investigator, Murdoch's first job was to speak to the Day family, who told him their son had travelled to Australia in 1969. If you could tell me who you are and and your relationship to, to Billy Day? Well, uh, I'm Trevor Day. Um, I'm Bill's youngest brother. I'm from Ipswich in, in England. I was only a young kid when Bill went to Australia. What are your memories of him? He was a lovable bloke. He was a good looking bloke and he was always smiling. He was as tough as old boots. Solid big bloke. This is a solid bloke. I think he was a middleweight boxer. Not the kind of person you could trifle with. No, no. Bill Day came to Australia with his mate Dave Burt, two young blokes in search of a better life. How often do you think of your old mate Billy Day? Quite often. You know, sometimes I lay in bed at night and I think, oh, I wonder whatever happened to Bill. Uh, you know, he's a real good mate and, as you know, he hadn't been seen for, what, around about 50 years, so... What do you think happened to him? Oh, I think he most probably got murdered. The two friends had worked and travelled around Australia for nearly a year. Bill Day had come to Sydney on his own. Dave Burt had found some work in a copper mine in Bougainville but he suggested that Bill could stay with some Englishmen he knew that were sharing an apartment in this building behind me. So Bill moved in, and soon he was invited to go on a road trip with one of the men living in the apartment. He knew that man as Peter Brown, when in fact, he was Peter Macari. Bill Day wrote to his family in the UK three to four times a week 
for a period in excess of 12 months. Now, the last letter that the family received from Bill was in June, July 1970, when Bill told them that he was going to travel in a camper van from Sydney to Queensland with Peter Brown. It's not clear how far north the two of them travelled, but only one of them came back, and that was Peter Macari. This is all before Oaks takes place. The theory has long been that Billy Day perhaps knew what was going to happen and was going to blow the whistle. Did that strike you as a motive for murder? Quite possibly. Day was last heard of between June and August 1970. On the evidence, it would appear that Macari didn't start to really hatch the plot for the Qantas extortion and really put the wheels in motion, if you like, until the very early part of 1971, which was well past the time that Day had dropped off the planet. So what else could have motivated a murder? In 1970, Macari was wanted by authorities in Britain for a string of offences. Firearms, property and sexual. Macari was gay, which at that time was a crime in England and in New South Wales. What did Day really know about his travelling companion? Was Billy Day gay? Like Bill, he definitely wasn't homosexual. It's been proven since that Macari was. Like at the time, uh, like Macari, I think he was a very good con man. Well, he must have been because he, well, he had me conned. I didn't think he was homosexual. And, you know, most probably the same with Bill. Oh, yeah, I'll go on a trip with him. And, you know, things changed. And maybe Bill, he wanted to get out of the place. Macari's come back later and shot him or whatever. Dave Burt believes Peter Macari was carrying a gun on that trip. He saw a Winchester rifle in Macari's camper van when he was in Sydney. There's also the question of Macari's controlling personality. Macari seemed to select people like Billy Day, whether they were gay or not, compliant people he could manipulate. Very much so. He was a person who, um, he, was, he was in charge. He called the shots. His co-accused in the Qantas extortion, Ray Pointing, was certainly someone that he knew would do what he was told. Maybe Bill Day wouldn't do what he was told. Perhaps that's why he disappeared. Regardless, Macari started using Bill Day's identity soon after the road trip in 1970. Used Day's name to book accommodation, buy plane tickets, purchase property, open bank accounts. Mr Macari has used Mr Day's identity on no less than 30 occasions between November 1970 and the 4th of August 1971 when he was ultimately arrested for his role in the Qantas extortion. When police arrested Peter Macari, Dave Burt was back in Sydney. He was with his mates having a beer in a beachside hotel when he saw a photograph of Macari on the front page of a newspaper. You know, I said to me, mates, I said, bloody hell, I know that bloke. Yeah, you know, I start reading the story, and it mentioned me mate, Bill Day, and he'd bought an E-type Jag in his name, and uh, so I thought, oh, I'd better do something about this. So I hopped in the taxi and went up to the police station. Bird attempted to persuade the police to investigate the disappearance of his mate, but says he was fobbed off. Unfortunately, there was no evidence Day was ever recorded as a missing person in New South Wales or Queensland until 1995. So there was a massive lost opportunity there for 25 years where things could have been done, but weren't. 
Coming up, the interview. Was he a good liar? An excellent liar. He'd only tell you what he wanted you to know. Did Peter Macari also kill his own brother? Macari was either very unlucky or there's something more to it. In 1994, Detective Sergeant Mark Murdoch began investigating the disappearance and possible murder of Billy Day on behalf of the coroner. He didn't have a body, so one of his first lines of inquiry was to check amongst the unidentified remains of more than 400 people that had been found in New South Wales and Queensland between 1970 and 1994. This was a classic needle in a haystack situation, a long shot. But without DNA, medical and dental records for Day, this would prove to be a forensic dead end at this stage. Whilst trying to keep an open mind during the course of the investigation, um, most significant lines of inquiry came back to Mr McCarry. Detective Murdoch only ever had one person of interest in his inquiry, and that was the Qantas hoaxer Peter McCarry who'd been in and out of jail in Britain and Australia since the age of 18. Since being deported back to Britain in 1980, he'd spent yet more time in jail. When Detective Murdoch flew over to interview him in 1995, Macari was once again a free man, living on a houseboat. We just had to sit in the car and wait for the tide to go out and for the houseboat to settle on the, on the bottom of the bay before we could walk out and grab him. So it was uh, yeah, an interesting day. Was he living in any kind of luxury on that? No, uh, very limited means. The houseboat was an old, an old thing, um, more a bit of an old fishing trawler. I think any money he had, he'd well and truly spent. Despite no outward appearance of wealth, Macari made sure his lawyer was present for the police interview. What transpired next was a very carefully constructed set of answers from Macari about the hoax and the disappearance of Bill Day. Was he proud of the Qantas hoax? He spoke about it like it happened yesterday. It was very, very fresh in his, in his mind. A great deal of accuracy about events, times. But Macari was not so fresh on the subject of how he assumed the identity of Bill Day. The line of questioning was put to Macari, like, OK, well, as it turned out, you use the name William Day on numerous occasions. Here's the evidence of the occasions you used Day's name. What can you tell me about Day? And his response to that was that he, he couldn't remember Bill Day, he doesn't remember meeting him. He didn't recognise a photo of Day when I showed him his photo. He says that he adopts the names of people that he knows, but he has no recollection of Day or ever having meeting him. Was he a good liar? An excellent liar. He was uh, cunning, charismatic. He'd only tell you what he wanted you to know. If you wanted to tease something else out of him, you basically had to be able to prove to him that what he was saying wasn't right. And that was as close as Murdoch came to pinning the disappearance of Bill Day on Macari. In the absence of a body, he didn't have enough to charge the Qantas hoaxer. Do you conclude that he was a murderer? Look, I wouldn't put it past him. Can't prove it, but uh, I wouldn't put it past him. While he was in England, Detective Murdoch discovered that British police were investigating the disappearance and murder of Peter Macari's brother, George, in 1962. Peter Macari's brother, George, mysteriously vanished in England. His body later found in a shallow grave. 
Makari was the last person to see him alive and was interviewed by police, but no one has ever been charged with the murder. You've got Peter Makari being the last person to have had any dealings with his brother before he disappeared and was subsequently found deceased. You've also now got him the last known person to have had contact with William Day before he essentially dropped off the planet. Again, coincidence indicates that Makari was either very unlucky or um, there's something more, more to it. In 2013, Peter Makari took all of his secrets with him to the grave. He committed suicide without leaving a note. He left no clues and he made no admissions. He might have redeemed himself by helping police to bring Billy Day home, but he chose not to. Still to come. Who are you? Call me Mr. Brown. The business of being Mr. Brown. They were offering us a million dollars. And we thought, we've turned into Mr. Brown. <laughs> Peter McCary, the famous Qantas hoaxer, left a terrible trail of destruction wherever he went. He was an enigma, a man of riddles, and someone who left so many questions unanswered, especially for the family of Bill Day. McCary took his secret to the grave. It's the family tragedy that's never gone away. Yeah. And it's, um, until mum passed away, I suppose it was always on her lips all the time. When something happened, it was Bill's birthday, or, you know, certain times of the year, that will always come flapping back. You can't, you can't lose that. You still think he's alive? I'd like to think he's alive more so than dead. If there's no body, there has to be a little bit of hope, I suppose. If Billy is still out there, and he does see this, what would be your message to him? I'd just say, Bill, I'd love to meet you. I love you. I've, it's been a long bloody time since I clapped eyes on him, and I'm sure the rest of the family would love to see him. But. If you don't want to see us, then that's fine. Is the file still in a, in a state, do you think, that if someone went back through it now and, and looked at the DNA evidence and so forth, do you think it's possible to take this forward again somehow? Yeah, I wouldn't see why not. DNA technology and other scientific uh, means have advanced significantly since this investigation was undertaken in 1995, like it's 20-odd years ago. Bill's brother Trevor recently supplied his DNA to the police in the hope that they can use science to find out what really happened to Billy Day and to bring closure to his family. Commonwealth Police Mascot, Constable Boyce speaking. Uh, can I speak to the officer in charge? It's for you. Who is it? Who are you? Call me Mr. Brown. Back in 1986, filmmaker Scott Hicks was facing closure of a different kind. During the final stages of production for Call Me Mr. Brown, Qantas tried to block the movie's release. And they sent a delegation to South Australia to monster the Premier of South Australia then, John Bannon, and said to them, you have to stop this film. You've got to put, put a stop to it. And to On his, what grounds? On the grounds that it was jeopardising uh, air, aircraft security, which was exactly why we had tried to make sure that they would review it beforehand and make sure it didn't. But they were smartly reminded by the 
Premier, um, that this is a, a democracy. We have a thing called freedom of speech and we're not in the habit of shutting films down. It's no good. We could be facing a major disaster. So their next move was to talk to us about possibly buying all the world rights to the movie so that they could bury it. Finish packing and bring them to my office immediately. First time I've ever seen half a million in cash. And we thought, oh, we've turned into Mr. Brown. <laughs> it was just... <laughs> they were offering a bag of cash as they'd given to Mr. Brown. They were offering us a million dollars. You know, he only got half a million, so, you know. In the end, Qantas got their way by paying the broadcaster not to show the movie. Listen to me, you bastard. There's real life money in these cases. Now you do your part and phone us back. True to their word, they buried the movie. To my knowledge, it's never been screened in Australia. So it really sort of disappeared without a trace, a bit like the rest of Macari's money. There is the one intriguing aspect of the whole affair. There's still a quarter of a million dollars outstanding of the extortion money that Qantas paid to Peter Macari. So, where did it go? He certainly told me his thoughts on, on where the money ended up. But... Uh, where was that? Oh, he said the police got it. He survived jail here as an openly gay man in a very heavy jail and seems to do pretty well, thrives in there even. You wonder whether there's a little bit of money changed hands outside of the walls to make sure that that's happened. Is that a common practice? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Everyone in jail would have known who he was and everyone in jail would have known he had money somewhere. But there's no evidence that the police got it or, or prison officers got it or anyone else got it. Frank Sorahan, the miner who supplied the gel ignite for the replica bomb, spent time in a jail cell with Macari and Pointing. And what were the discussions in there? Oh, he told me a few things. He told me he had uh, the money hidden uh, underwater at Sydney and stuff like that. But I think that was just a uh, bullshit story. We speculate in the film there's a safe under the sea. Macari did buy scuba diving gear in, in the midst of his orgy of spending and a waterproof safe. So we thought, well, logically, he probably secreted some money down there. Was he specific about it, that? Did he mention which cave, which beach? He did say that I can't remember. You can't remember, yeah. Frank. Crikey's. Down in Sydney. Down in Sydney, that's a big area, son. Only a little Because <laughs> it was never found. Well, yeah, they say it was never found. Um, who knows? It's a great mystery. Someone knows where that money is. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs>